Hello folks, welcome back to World War II TV and the third show in our epic El Alamein fortnight of presentations. And I've got some guests from various different locations and countries. We've got a New Zealander, an Australian, a South African, uh, we've got an Italian, we've got a couple of Brits, um, but I really wanted the American perspective because one of the things that I think is burdening us Brits of a certain age when it comes to the Battle of El Alamein is all the iconic images the mythology bagpipes through minefields montgomery versus rommel the black beret the 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 tin mugs on sand stoves in the desert all that kind of stuff is 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 seared into our consciousness of how we grew up i just explained to my guest i remember playing el alamein in the playground at school with sticks as the infield rifles and things like that. So it's part of our whole consciousness. But Jonathan Parshall, our guest today, you may remember him, well, you will remember him from the Shattered Sword uh, show we did about a year ago about the Battle of Midway. He is a naval historian, been doing it and writing about this um, war for 30 plus years and likes to delve into kind of the um, the, 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 the weeds and, and the reeds and sort of go back to basics and start at the beginning. That's how he brought his uh, studies to the Battle of Midway, and he's turning his attention right now to the year of 1942. So we bring him in to talk about El Alamein. So John Parshall, something of a legend. Uh, it's in my pleasure to present to join, have him join us. So good afternoon, John. How are you today? Yeah, I'm very well. Something of a legend. I, 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 I'd say that's ambitious, but uh, but thank you for having me. It's lovely to be here again. Well, thank you. And as I said, you know, you heard me say that the preamble there about the the mythology that 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 associates itself with the Alamein, and and there are between three hundred and five hundred published books that yeah. focus on El Alamein, and that isn't counting regimental histories and divisional histories that include it as a chapter. It's a phenomenal amount. So, just before is. we get into the conversation, as the American growing up, understanding about and reading about World War Two, at what point does El Alamein pop up on John Parshall's radar? Well, that's a that's a good question, actually. I mean, I've I've been interested in World War II for a long time, and so I, yeah, I, it would be tough for me to pin down the exact date that it came into my consciousness. But you know, I had that that big time life uh, series of books on on uh, World War II, and I'm I'm certain I I read the the volume on the on the desert during that time. And of course, you know, speaking of mythologizing, you know, Americans of a certain age have all been raised on having seen multiple viewings of the movie Patton. Yeah, and so you know our mental models of of Bernard Law Montgomery, of course, are shaped very much by that movie, and and we are taught to despise him as a finicky little martinet, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I think that Montgomery kind of falls into sort of the same camp that MacArthur does. You know, you either love him or you hate him, and there's yeah. no yeah. there's no middle ground. Um, but to that point, I actually have a what I think is a fairly nuanced view of montgomery and i can uh, there are pros and cons to the guy i guess that's that's all i'd say the, the other thing i'd say too as you mentioned you know i've been writing this book on uh, the year 1942 for the last 13 years and so i'm a i'm a big picture generalist kind of guy i'm very interested in doctrine but i'm particularly interested in how the allied militaries during that year sort of transformed themselves to uh, rise to the challenges that were in front of them. And and in both the British and the American cases, you know, we had to learn how to fight the Germans. The Americans, of course, have to learn how to fight the Japanese. And then the, the Red Army also is going through arguably the most uh, contorted set of transformations during that year. But that's, that's kind of where my interest comes from. I'm not an Alamein specialist. I'm a big picture guy, but but Alamein is a really interesting battle. And we want big picture because we'll have some deeper dives in particular nations' involvements and divisions during the course of this week. So yeah. the big view is is important to us. And you know, the, the, one of the questions that will be coming up is, is it a turning point? And if it is a turning point, how big a turning point is it? And people debate that. But you know, the, the, the reality is, is that the British hadn't really been winning before El Alamein and they didn't really stop losing after El Alamein. You could, you know, in, in ground, in large scale ground battles, certainly. And the opposite yeah. is true for the Germans. The Germans hadn't really been losing before it and hadn't really, didn't really win much after it. So, and, and you know, it came up with, with both um, uh, Cedric on the first day, it came up a couple of weeks with Alan Allport. For the British public, it's definitely a turning point. It's oh, it, like huge. Battle of Britain. It's definitely this, sense that we have kicked ass and 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 Rommel deserved his, this ass kicking and and it's something to celebrate back in the UK but 
for sure. The battle itself, you know, it, for all its its obvious significance, it it and it obviously was a victory. It it wasn't perfectly fought, but but no. both both sides made mistakes. Both sides. Yes. There, it's it's rife for anal analyzation eighty years on, and what could have been done, and this, that, and you you know your your the title for the show I think is the winner. You came, I said to you, come up with an idea, and people have loved it. If you still can't do combined arms, at least use a lot of artillery. So we may as well start with that point there, you know. Sure. And, and we'll start with for those who, who 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 don't know, and also your own individual interpretation. What what do you mean by combined arms in the de Western Desert in nineteen forty two? Well, one of the, you know, recurring themes that you see in British operations during 1942 is that they just can't get decent cooperation between their armor and their infantry. And this this is just crazy as far as, as an American is concerned. Um, we weren't terribly good at that during 1942 ourselves, but just to fast forward, um, there's a really interesting article written by a guy named Forrester in the Journal of Military History it came out a few years ago where he's talking about the evolution of combined arms in 21st Army Group, that is Montgomery's Army Group in Northern Europe in late 1944. And at that point in time, the British are still debating whether or not it makes sense to have armored brigades and infantry brigades working together, which is just, you know... <laughs> Everybody else has figured this out, guys. Everybody knows how to do this. You know, the American army by 1944 is superlatively good at making that kind of stuff happen. And the British are still kind of behind the eight ball. And you see that happening in the Western Desert in 1942, just over and over and over again, that British tank attacks will be driven in without sufficient uh, infantry backing them up or artillery or what have you, and just getting absolutely chopped to pieces. Um, in some cases, too, even even by the Italians, you know, if you look at the uh, the battles uh, at Gazala around uh, in, in the Cauldron area, um, there's an episode where Rommel is is uh, basically turned himself around to go off and, and beat up on one of the British brigade boxes and leaves the Italians along with some German 88s in a. a a picket line, if you will, and the British attack it with their armored formations and just get absolutely shot to pieces. And so you see this, this happening over and over again. What I see big picture uh, at Alamein is not a triumph of uh, British tanks. I really think that uh, there are a number of kind of behind the scenes things going on that are really, really important. And, and the first, and I think most important is the maturation of the British artillery arm, which was always considered by the Germans the best arm in the British Army was their artillery. But by the time you get to Alamein, it is it is metastasized into this much more lethal animal. And the unsung hero of that, I, I think, is uh, Brigadier General Sidney Kirkman. I think you've got a picture of him yeah. uh, that we can take a look at. Kirkman is brought in by Montgomery. He's handpicked by Montgomery to be his artillery commander and brings him in um, and outlines for Kirkman what he wants, you know, the guns to do in this battle, which is rolling barrages and that sort of thing. But Kirkman is, is very astute. And one of the things that he picks up on is that during the first battle of El Alamein, the second New Zealand division had come up with this new technique that they called a stonk, a standard concentration of fire. And it's basically using time on target salvo. So the, the, the game plan is that we've got a target out there in the desert. We are going to stagger the fire of our batteries such that they all land at exactly the same time. Because we know that once a target is taken under fire within relatively short order, a couple few minutes, the target will go to ground and dig in and do whatever they can to get under cover. And then the lethality of your bombardment decreases markedly. So the New Zealanders had pioneered this at the first battle of Alamein and it had been just devastating. Uh, they got to the point where they could put 500 shells into a half a kilometer square box in three minutes flat. And Kirkman knows a good thing when he sees it. He's like, this is really, really interesting. And he extends that technique across all of 30 Corps, which is the infantry corps, um, so that they can use hundreds of barrels in this fashion. 
and it, you know it takes a lot of training you got to have a really good communications network to make that all happen you know so that everybody has the same playbook and they understand okay here's the grid square where i'm going to be hitting i'm here that means that when we hear the go signal i'm going to wait for 20 seconds for my battery for, so that the further range batteries can get their shells off first yada 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 it takes a lot of training to make that happen but if you can do that it's like this giant fire hose you know that you can aim anywhere on the battlefield and all of a sudden just you know wrench the target with shells so that's enormously important the other thing that i think is critical is the maturation of western desert air force i think there is a strong argument to be made that at this point in time Cunningham's Air Force uh, and Tedder's larger Air Air Forces, Egypt or Middle East, I should say, is the best Air Force in the world. That they can do the whole panoply of of air power. They can do strategic bombing. They can do maritime search, maritime strike. They can do battlefield interdiction. They can do air supremacy, and they can certainly do tactical air support as well. Um, and the thing that is really interesting for me as an American looking at that is that Tedder and Cunningham are doing this with this polyglot force. You know, it's Royal Air Force, you've got South Africans, you've got Australians, you've got some some Poles in there, you've got increasing numbers of Americans too. You know, and to use an analog, the other crack uh, tactical force that we look at this year would be uh, Wolfram Richthofen's Flieger Corps 8. They are the ground support specialists in the Luftwaffe. And you see them at Sevastopol, you see them at Kharkov, and you see them on the Eastern Front. They're a really good unit, but they can only, they don't do the same panoply of missions. And if you would ask the Germans, okay, I want you to come up with a crack unit that can do ground support, and it's going to be composed of Germans, Italians, Romanians, and Finns, you know, could they have done what Cunningham did with his multinational force? It's laughable. No way. So British artillery, um, British air power. And the other thing that, that is going on here too is that Montgomery, for all of his flaws as a human being, is a really good trainer. And he recognizes that being able to get through these minefields is really critical. And so the development of a, a standardized methodology for attacking minefields, they actually set up a sapper school and they're going to run every division in 30 corps is going to go through that school so that we have standard techniques for clearing an eight, eight yard wide corridor, you know, yada, yada, yada. They got all that down. Um, so I, I feel like those are sort of the behind the scenes pieces that are really critical to the success of the British Army in this battle. It ain't tanks. It's the other yeah. stuff. And thank you for plugging the shows that are coming up, because Mike Beck told tomorrow is going to be talking about the tactical air power developments, and we're going to be talking about the the, the Sapper School later in the week as well. So, uh, there you go. well done for that. And I, you know, we've got Montgomery up on on screen there, and I chose that photo a because it's public domain, copyright free, but also because he's smiling. And I think you know we 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 talked yeah. about this idea of the reputation from the pattern movie and he's not seen as much of a people person and we we tend to focus on the people he doesn't get on with but of yeah. course there are lots of people he does go on, get on with very well and his relationship with 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 Kirkman was very good i mean he personally yeah. selected Kirkman to to be his artillery advisor Kirkman gave these suggestions he'd got from New Zealanders and the Australians and what have you. Montgomery took them on board and, and developed them. And, and and Montgomery's relationship, I think, with Cunningham and Tedder was was okay. Certainly it wasn't awful. Yep. Um, yep. And what, why have we forgotten that Montgomery can get on with people? Um, yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. You know, he's a complex guy. He's, uh, he's yeah. a sociopath. I mean, let's be honest. You know, he... He is the unloved conjunction of, you know, a, a preacher and a, a teenage mother, nine kids. She beats them all. He beats, you know, his schoolmates in turn. I mean, he's he's he is a wretched human being. Let's 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 be yeah. clear here. Um, you know, sets a fellow cadet's clothing on fire in, in Sandhurst. I mean, my God. Um, and. For me, too, I look at Auchinleck, his predecessor, in a pretty favorable light. I think that Auchinleck had a lot of really good ideas for how the British Army in the desert should have been reformed to do combined arms better. 
Auchinleck, unfortunately for him, is not necessarily a great commander, and he doesn't seem to have the ability to make his subordinate commanders do what he wants them to do. And so that's a problem. I think that Montgomery is absolutely scurrilous in how he attacks Auchinleck's reputation. Um, but, you know, now get to the, to the positive sides of the man. He's a tremendous trainer. He is uh, electrifying in terms of his energy level and the ability that he has to make Eighth Army believe in itself again, which is tremendous. Um, because this is an army that, that has been, you know, beaten consistently throughout this year. And yet, at a certain level, they're like, we're better than this. You know, why do we keep losing? I know that we're better than this. They just needed a commander to come in and say, you know, the battle days are over. Here's what we're going to do to, you know, to drive the new agenda forward. Uh, and, and he does have, Montgomery has the strength of will to, to you know, impose his vision of what he wants this army to be on this formation. He's by and large successful. Using a sporting analogy, it's like that situation in a, in a soccer, football, whatever, when a coach gets changed, who does with exactly the same squad of players what the previous coach had been trying to do, but for whatever reason, it just didn't come together. The ingredients were there. Fair. The, di the direction had kind of been set. The, the, everyone yeah. knows what they're trying to do, but it just needed someone to come in and pull it all together and and yeah, get people to believe in themselves. And I think you know that that is Montgomery's great great trait. People are saying in the sidebar, am I starting to really uh, is Monty becoming my favorite? Well, not, again, not as a human being, no, but right. as as a commander of men, I think he's he's very pretty damn good at what he does. And it came up with Cedric and I on Monday, I'm interested in your opinion. He's also where Oakenleck isn't, he's a master of the media war. He's a master of, of, of uh, communicating to the public, communicating to the press. And yep. his relationship is better with his subordinates than it is his, his peers and his commanders. That's where Montgomery's relationship with fellow the, you know, commanders at his level is not, you know, Bradley, you know, uh, later on Eisenhower, even later on is, is, is questionable. Yeah. But with, with people up below him, it's generally quite good because he gets rid of the ones that don't, he doesn't like. Which is normal, isn't it? I suppose. Right, right. No, it, you you make a very good point. Um, you know, here's another analog between Monty and MacArthur's. They they were they both would have made millions as Madison Avenue ad men in New York City because they did have that ability to play the PR game very effectively. And one of the things that Monty is better at um, than Auk the Auk was is in this sort of upward management. You know. How do I keep uh, Alan Brooke off my back? And most importantly, how do I keep Churchill off my back? Mm. Because um, from a political standpoint, you know, if we put this battle into context, Churchill is desperate, desperate for a victory. He is politically at his weakest. Um, the first six months of 1942 have just been a dumpster fire. Uh, there, there is a, there is a, a one month period in November to December of 1941, where the Royal Navy loses more capital ships than the Americans are going to lose at Pearl Harbor. Okay. Uh, they get kicked back from Serenica and then in the Pacific, you've got, you know, the destruction of the Malayan army, fall of Singapore, 138,000 soldiers lost. Burma is down for the count you know it's just just one thing after another the channel dash in february of 1942 you know so everything is going wrong everywhere all the time finally to the point where churchill is hauled up in front of the house of commons in july and is forced to fight his way out of a vote of no confidence yeah. and yeah i mean he he manages to navigate that relatively easily but as sir stafford cripps said uh, during the same time period, you know, there's a, there's a feeling on the street that the common man feels that something is wrong and needs to be put right without delay. Furthermore, Churchill knows that eventually the Americans are going to overshadow British contributions in this war. And it is absolutely paramount that the British be able to demonstrate 
that they're an important part of this alliance and that they can put together an all British victory over the Germans just to have a sense of legitimacy around their contribution to the war. So, um, yeah, the bottom line is this is this is a very important time. Uh, this is a very important battle. And Montgomery's got to keep Churchill off of his back long enough that he can do the training that he needs to do and put this battle plan together, yada, yada, yada. There's a lot of stuff that he's got to manage. No, definitely. I mean, we'll address some of the comments coming in. I mem remember a conversation I had with a staff officer whose name I can't remember. I think it was Hamilton. And he was involved in lots of meetings in for mid-42 up into 43 in Tunisia, but British and Americans and various other forces there. And I asked him to summarize the conversation in the British and the Commonwealth forces and the Americans. He said, well, it kind of went like this. The Americans, the British saying to the Americans, we have been fighting this war for a couple of years, you know. We do know what we're doing. To which American response was, yes, and you've been losing. And 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 and, and, it, and he was a Brit saying that. And it, it, yeah. there's, it, it's it's painfully near the mark. That's the that's the problem, you know. But while while they're losing, and this is getting back to the point I think we're going to return to, is they are gradually fi fine tuning the arc. So let's address combined arms. We had a couple of comments yeah. come come in. So Bullet Tooth Tony, thanks for joining us, saying Operation Compass. British use excellent combined arms. Obviously, that's forty forty one. So, um, yeah. uh, excellent is is better. I, I I'm not sure they they were excellent there, but um, but 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 certainly that the British have been demonstrating an ability on some level to to work things together. But as you, you said, sure their revolution it. doesn't come in until later on. Right. And you, I, I guess, you know, my, my counter to that would be, well, yeah, OK, I'm, but I'm a guy writing a book about 1942 and you sure as hell don't see it happening in 1942. You know what's going on there? Um, the other thing I, I point to uh, if we're going to talk about combined arms is just the basic shape of Montgomery's battle plan, which I just think is ludicrous in a lot of respects. So you yeah, so take a look at the at the northern sector. I think it's the next slide there, right? Yeah, yeah. and th this is from John's uh, own map that he's working on for his new project. So the, thanks for the lovely, colorful map there. People love maps. I love maps. Um, and this is, you know, derived from uh, both German sources and also a really good topographical map that I found. You've got this weird arrangement. we got 30 corps up here in the north, right? we got five divisions up there. Those infantry divisions are going to be the ones that are driving in the actual attack to get through these minefields and get onto uh, Materia Ridge. I don't even know how you pronounce the dang thing. Anyway, but at the same time, we've got uh, 10 corps, the armored corps. They're occupying exactly the same piece of real estate. As I put it in my manuscript, you know, they're sort of spraddled on top of each other in this unholy mockery of combined arms in that you got two completely separate cores who are occupying the same real estate but have no intention of operating together whatsoever it's bizarre i can't think of any other instance of a of a configuration like this anywhere in the war that both of these formations are going to separately drive their paths through these minefields but they are not to be intermingled and that somehow 10 Corps is going to move its armor onto the ridge and then await uh, a German counterattack and beat it off by themselves without any of the infantry supposedly uh, anywhere near them. This is the initial conception of the battle plan, I should say. That's just weird. It's just weird. I mean, why, why would you do that? Why would you deliberately eschew... Um, the ability to have backing infantry in that initial fight. And they yet you have Lumsden, uh, the commander of 10 Corps, basically saying that tanks must be used as cavalry. They cannot be used for infantry support, which is a pretty bold statement uh, in the face of what has been going on here uh, for the last year in the desert where they've been markedly unsuccessful. So that's one thing that's kind of strange. The, the second is that You've deliberately created this corps de chasse, or however you pronounce that in French. My French is terrible, too, in 10 corps, where we've got three armored divisions. Um, but it's very unclear what is supposed to happen with those armored divisions act after they actually fight and supposedly win this battle on the ridge. Um, Montgomery makes the statement that, well, you know, once that, that battle is won, the Africa Corps should be fairly easy to round up. And anybody who has an iota 
of experience in the desert knows that Rommel is not the kind of guy that gets rounded up. So how do you intend to use that core to prosecute after a breakthrough? Nobody seems to know. Furthermore, if your idea is to use that core to prosecute, why do you have your best armored division, which is 7th Armored, down in the south portion of this battlefield doing what is intended to be mostly a fixing attack to prevent armored reserves on the southern flank in the axis to be moved up to the north. The whole thing is bizarre. Um, so so, so why, why do you think it is? Because obviously when we get to Montgomery, yeah, we come up with Cedric and it comes up every time, is that what he says a battle plan was meant to do when he wrote about it later is not necessarily anything to do what about what he thought it was going to do at the time. He was the master of reinventing the instructions. Yes. His operation Goodwood in Normandy comes to mind, and, uh, and so right. so we can't we can't bring Montgomery on on a, on a link and have him join us uh, to talk about what his plan was. But you know, you're analyzing this. You're good at the big picture. You're good at analyzing things from a kind of a neutral point of view. W what is your explanation for his battle plan? That is that is a really interesting question. And what I've just described is his first iteration of the battle plan. Um, and, and it gets absolutely lambasted by uh, the commanders in both 10 Corps and 30 Corps. Um, I think that he did not, that the conceptual light bulb had not gone on in Monty's mind regarding how tanks were supposed to be used in the desert. I, I honestly don't think he knew what he was doing in that respect. What ends up happening, of course, is, is he presents this battle plan to his commanders, and despite the fact that he's made the admonition earlier that there's to be no more belly aching and orders are to be accepted and you know carried out, you know all of the divisional and corps commanders are like, this is ludicrous. You are not going to drive uh, advances of six miles or more through these enormous minefields and clear all of those lanes secure the initial phase lines and get 10 cores armor through here all in one night. It's just not going to happen. And furthermore, the trust level between the armor and the infantry, particularly the infantry at this point, um, is at the pit's own level because in a number of the, the preceding battles, you know, first, first Alamein, you know, second New Zealand division is is down a brigade at this point because they put in a, an attack at first Alamein where they were supposed to get uh, British armor support and it didn't materialize and that whole brigade was just chewed to pieces. And there are bitter comments uh, in some of the New Zealand histories about, you know, watching the finest uh, troops in the world being chewed to pieces while those pommy bastards were back in the rear in their tanks frying sausages, you know. so. Yeah, there's there's a lot of uh, discussion in in both the core and the divisional level with this initial scheme, and eventually what Montgomery ends up doing is scales back uh, the ambition level a bit and says that okay, actually ten cores tanks will be there to support the infantry, uh, and and we're going to advance together at least be within proximity of each mm -hmm. other uh, rather than trying to break ten core all the way through in one night. Thank you for that. I mean, to, to, to be devil's advocate a little bit, um, it came up with Cedric on Monday, is that Montgomery is quite good at understanding what doesn't work well within 8th Army and, and not trying to use that part of his uh, formation and not try and do, not try and fight the battle like Rommel would fight it, for, fight right. it with what his limitations are. And the infantry armour um angle is really interesting because i would argue as a normandy historian that that doesn't even get better till about half the way or to the end of the normandy campaign i think we arrive in normandy in june with still pretty terrible infantry armor cooperation it does get better i yeah. think by the time we get in towards germany which i realize is getting very late in the day i think it got it got itself really sorted out but that doesn't where the tactical air support had, had arguably been sorted out from 42 onwards uh right. thanks to Conningham, and we'll do that tomorrow i think infantry armor doesn't get sorted out for a long time. We could bring John Buckley on to talk about that, of course. But but Montgomery possibly knows this, and that's maybe but maybe why he, although we have this perception of the armour being pivotal to the battle, and it, it was important, is that he realises it's not perfect in a cooperation with the infantry. And so he favours, we're back to artillery again. But yeah. 
Well, and 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 to an extent, the the battle plan that ends up being come up with is fairly defensive in nature. In that, if you look at the Battle of Alam Halfa, you know, basically what we did there is we, as Robert Satino points out, you know, this is the first occasion where there's actually been a complete British armored division operating as an armored division, a complete division. You know, the, the the Germans come up and try to attack that ridge and they run into a fully constituted British tank force and they just get shot to pieces. And so if you look at what's supposed to happen here, I'm going to get my tanks on top to on top of Matera Ridge and uh, I'm going to let the Germans come at me and I'm going to do the same thing. You know, same story, different ridge. I'm just going to blow them away when they when they approach me because they are going to be obligated to counterattack or so he feels so i i, I kind of think that's that's what's going on there is that i just want to put myself forward enough and get a you know close enough to the german supply lines that they're going to be obligated to react and then i can shift over to the tactical defensive and destroy them well that's certainly what cedric mass thought on monday you know and and james holland always talks about the German, as he recalls it, the Pavlovian need to counterattack. No matter what goes on, they can't help themselves. Yeah. They, they, they need to counterattack. Um, we've got Gary's comment here about Montgomery yeah, mistakenly you... thinks that the DAC is essentially a corps de chasse. So that's what he's trying to emulate, I think. Ultra helps diminish the problems about his misunderstandings about the enemy. What, what's your reaction to that? Well, okay. I, I think that's a really good comment. I'd like to talk about Ultra a little bit because Please. Okay, so I'm Battle of Midway scholar, right? That's yep. that's my gig. And I feel like in the historiography of World War II as a whole, during the 1980s and 1990s, when we got these first books coming out and talking about the importance of code breaking within the war, that the interpretational pendulum swung a little too far uh, towards the importance of code breaking. That it, it seems to make perfectly good common sense that well if i'm reading the other guy's mail and i know where they're coming you know of course i'm going to win that battle that is not true because it's one thing to have that operational level intelligence in your hand it's quite another to be able to translate that intel into tactical yeah. results on the battlefield yeah. I mean, all the intel in the world wouldn't have done the Americans any good at Midway if they didn't have aviators that were good enough to actually put the bomb on target. You know, you look at some of the events in that battle, like Dick Best's attack against the Akagi or Wade McCluskey's decisions. It's, it's taken us uh, 33 minutes for Midway to come up, John. <laughs> well, there we are, you know. But the, but the same thing then applies also to the Western Desert, because we have several instances during the battles in this year where... The Auk, for instance, has got perfectly good Ultra coming into his hands, telling him what's going to happen, you know, in terms of enemy intentions. They can't translate it into victory. They're not good enough on the battlefield. So, yes, Gary is correct in saying that Ultra is, is once again giving us some really good um, views into enemy intentions. But I, I would argue it is still an open question whether or not this army is good enough to to still you know be able to then translate that into victory on the battlefield. And the other thing That's about Ultra, it came up with Glenn Harper, and he's on again this week when we, we talked about with him about the New Zealanders in Crete is Freiburg Ultra the invasion of Crete. Is that as you said back when when the, all the Ultra Bletchley co breaking stuff came out in the eighties. That means from then on, every time you say ultra, you have to say in brackets afterwards, it shortened the war by one year, two years, three years, whichever we went right. for, or the, the war winning asset. It was the, the ace up the allies, theory, whichever phrase you yeah. want to use. But there was, of course, that period in 40, 41, 42, when its benefit hadn't really been proven yet. It Theoretically, yes, being able to understand the enemy's uh, intentions before they themselves knew is a great thing concept but the idea it got sealed as being this war deciding factor 40 years after war didn't it so i think we have to go back and look at it look at how ultra was perceived by commanders who would have mostly been in their 40s and 50s right in world war ii as some of this newfangled thing i think it, it you're i'm with you it's a, it it was it was a great asset but we rather over overcooked the omelet a little bit with omelet with ultra i think over the last few years i, I think that's absolutely right on the money uh that 
you know, at the end of the day, you still have to have troops that are good enough to to actually make it happen on the, on the battlefield. Although I, I will say that there's an uh, an instance later on in this battle uh, where it does come into play. You know, the very final tank fight uh, around Tel Akakir. Um, you know, Montgomery knows where the the Axis counterattack is going to be coming, and he puts the bulk of his armor where it needs to be. It's it's a you know it's a bloodbath, very heavy losses on both sides. But you know, Montgomery has more tanks to play with. For all that I've, you know, sort of poo-pooed the uh, the role of armor here, um, I, I, I do think that as Americans, we sometimes get uh, too hung up on the contribution that we made to this battle and that, you know, there's 300 brand new Shermans here on the battlefield and that's what turned the tide. And, I, you know, I, it, there's no question that Montgomery having new armor in in his uh, in his tank park is is an important asset. But you know American Shermans do not make up the bulk of of the armor force mm -hmm. here. That said, um, there's also a tendency I think in the American uh, side of things to 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 rip apart on the Sherman and to talk about its faults as a tank. No question that when, you know, we fast forward into 1944, when you're going up against universally long-barreled, you know, Panzer IVs and Panthers and that sort of thing, you know, the, the Sherman had some, some difficulties operating in that environment. But in 1942, it's, it's arguable that the Sherman is the finest tank on this battlefield. I mean, it can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with anything that, that the Axis have got. With the possible exception of the Mark IV uh, F2 Special, but you know, uh, Rommel doesn't have very many of those. He's got you know he's got a yeah. bare handful, and and Monty's got two hundred and fifty of these things. Even even the M3 Grant, uh, it has the same gun essentially, and this thing comfortably outranges anything that the Germans or the Italians have. Which means that again, if we're in a sort of a uh, a tactical defensive stance, and the and the Germans have got to you know come at us and deliver a counterattack. We have the ability to just stand back with those vehicles and and blaze away uh, before you know the Germans can even get in range in most mm. in most cases. I mean, you could kind of make the point that the idea of waiting for the counterattack is is going to bear fruit later on in the war. Well, even in in Tunisia, in kind of the, the tank destroyer aspect yeah. of the American military is is that you know that then they're, they're designed to be more in a defensive position and then take on the enemy armor when it's moving, when it's weaker. So, right. I mean, but, but when as soon as tanks came up, the sidebar went into conversations about the Sherman and the Matilda and the Crusader and the use of them. So, again, cutting through the the the, the, re, the, 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 myth, the, the mythology that we Brits have and, and those from the colonies and Commonwealth, as an American, you know, you're, you're brought up to kind of think that the British tanks are shit uh, in, in 40, 41, for, well, basically the whole war. And certainly beyond of that, that the doctrinal use of them is, is, is less than perfect. You know, what, what is your analysis of how British armor is faring in 42, both in terms of the types it has and, and yeah. its approach to, to, to what they're doing with them on the battlefield? Well, it's 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 not favorable. I gotta say, uh, I forget who it was that I read that uh, you know that whoever was in charge uh, of interwar uh, British armor design has much to answer for, and I, I think that that is basically true. Um, you know, for the bulk of 1942, most British tanks are still using a two pounder uh, that does not you know have sufficient penetrative power to do what it needs to do against a German tank. And the other problem is, you know, that same two pounder gun is also being used as the battalion uh, AT gun in a lot of the British uh, arm uh, infantry battalions. And so you've got this pea shooter that just cannot get it done against uh, against a, a good German tank. This is all changing by the time we get to Alamein. That's another thing that makes it so difficult for the Germans. The six pounder is now coming into play on both um you know, the AT gun level at the battalion level for British infantry units, but it's also you're starting to see limited numbers of crusaders that are armed with that six pounder. Um, the problem is that, okay, that's a better gun and it'll get it done, but the crusader as a vehicle is just 
uh, just mechanically still very unreliable and not up to snuff. It's not nearly as good a tank as a Sherman from a reliability standpoint. And I just saw the comment there in the bar that, yeah, the six pounder was was common by, by all the main. great Dominion knows his artillery. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. It is. So you look at, you know, some of the some of the German counterattacks that get launched at places like Point 29 and Kidney Ridge. Um, you know, there was a single British uh, infantry battalion that had about a dozen of these six pounders. Uh, destroys, I think it was 47 German tanks in an afternoon. That's a third of a division, you know. So, again, we're, what we're seeing is just little factors starting to add up. You know, all of a sudden, these British infantry battalions are much harder nuts to crack than they had been. You know, you, you can't overrun them as easily as, as you used to be able to. I think, too, that little details like the Australians, for instance, gave each one of their uh, infantrymen unfilled sandbags and a sheet of uh, sheet metal so that when I dig my slit trench out here in my forward position, uh, I'm going to be able to put some sandbags up around it and a little overhead cover as well, which means that German artillery is not going to be as effective against me. The other thing that ends up happening with a lot of those German counterattacks, of course, is going back to Kirkman's guns. Um, from what I understand, the average time for when fire support would be called in to when it actually started getting delivered on targets out in front of my lines, Kirkman had brought that number down to four minutes, and in some cases as little as two that's a phenomenal performance, even by modern standards. That's tremendous. And so what ends up happening here is that every time the Germans try to form up, and actually let me roll it back. One of the, one of the things that you see about the, the, the Wehrmacht just in general is that they had this tremendous ability to counterattack, to absorb an enemy attack, to regroup, to figure out, okay, where's a good point of counterattack, and then form up these mobile conf groups and just deliver a just a knockout, you know, a haymaker that that hits these exposed attacking units at just the wrong time, and and we see that over and over again too. Rommel can't do that in this battle. Every time he starts forming up these groups for a counterattack, the first thing that typically happens is Western Desert Air Force finds them out there and, you know, the Wellingtons come over the top and, you know, dump bombs all over them. And even if they do get off the starting line, you know, lo and behold, whatever British unit is under attack gets on the phone and says, you know, Sydney, can I have some of your firepower, please? And, you know, and four minutes later, down comes the deluge that just nails them to the ground. And even if they do end up getting into contact, then you run into these British battalions that are, you know, chock-a-block with these six-pounders, and all of a sudden it's really tough to actually drive that attack home and and break those formations. It's it's just a it's a different battlefield than the Germans are used to. No, definitely. And I think we'll 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 let we'll we'll move into artillery again because we can never talk about artillery and uh, uh, too much. I think really and. Um, and you know, as a, as a grandson of a, a royal artilleryman yeah. from World War II, I like to know about the artillery. I mean, because I think going back to these between three hundred and five hundred books about El Alamein, a lot of them have tried to find that one single thing that defined the battle. It's the magician who made the fake tanks came up in the side, right. the, the tactical air power, the Re, the Rebecca code, the spy in the Cairo, the, the intelligence thing, the armored strike, the clearing of the minefields, the whatever it would be that, or they picked a particular. Uh, episode of the battle it's the australians here the new zealanders there the french there the right. brits there you have to say really near the top of the list is artillery as a genuine reason for that battle going as well as it it did and you know as, as in in the overview we're not talking about artillery and we, we are on world war ii tv because we're better than some people but in general generally i don't think we're talking enough about artillery will you agree with that about that generally i mean in the, in the war completely but particularly i, I do no, I, I, you know, I've been contemplating actually a couple of articles on that very topic just because I think it's so interesting uh, also to look at it from a comparative standpoint. You know, if you look at some of the, uh, the big artillery bombardments of the war, I think about uh, the Japanese shoot against Corregidor. I look at Yamashita's preparatory bombardment before the invasion of Singapore. Um, 
In my book manuscript, every monthly chapter starts out with uh, a little picture, and then I write a little vignette just about that picture, just to kind of set some context. The picture I have for the month of October, which you know is when I'm going to talk about Alamein, is literally a picture of a pile of 25 pounder shell boxes sitting out in the middle of some firing position near Alamein, right? Uh, on the morning after the preparatory bombardment. And I forget the number of shells that I, you know, I kind of made an estimate. Okay, what's in this pile? And it was, you know, it's four or 500 shells that got fired by this one gun in that first night. That represents a number of shells that is greater than. Monstein's army at Sevastopol was able to fire in the course of that month. Okay. And the British expended that in a night. You see the same thing happening um, at the beginning bombardment of Operation Supercharge, which is our sort of yeah. second phase to this um, 360 guns firing off 150,000 shells in you know, over the course of several hours. And it's just, it's a staggering number of shells. It, it, was, it came out, I just ran the math uh, before we got on here. It's like 416 shells per barrel. Um, you know, there weren't too many armies in the world that could accumulate that kind of logistical largesse. And frankly, there's yeah, you know, they're all in the allies, right? And and, and it only gets better. I mean, the, 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 this we, again, it's come up and it'll come up more in these two weeks. Is the Germans yeah. to some extent are peaking by forty two? They, they they there's not much stuff they get better at after yeah. forty two. Um, in terms of artillery, I mean, this bombardment at Alamein, the supercharge, it's dwarfed dwarfed by things like totalized and tractable and normandy and then dwarfed again for the yeah. um uh shell tester and things like that the number of tubes we can bring to bear on the enemy by the end of 44 is 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 kind of it's mathematical absurd. super numbers it's like telephone yeah. numbers it's insane it's so, insane so, yeah, and the, and the and the Russians the Russians are doing the same thing on their end of the front too i mean if you want to talk about big artillery parks holy moses i mean uh, you know, you just look at the number of tubes that were aimed at, at uh, the beginning of Operation Uranus, and it's these are serious. You know, the Russians have entire artillery armies. You know that they're that they're putting into some of these battles. Anyway, back to Alamein. Lovely picture there of the twenty-five pounder. Um, great gun. Not the heaviest yeah. shell. I mean, it's a pretty small caliber weapon, frankly, for a, for a field piece. You know, the Germans, the Americans are all using 105s. This thing is an 88 or an 89 millimeter gun. Very high rate of fire, though. And again, um, when used with this sort of stonk technique, uh, high rate of fire in many cases is is almost more important than the weight of shell because we're trying to put as many shells down at the beginning of this bombardment as possible. So the twenty five pounder is just a perfect piece for that that sort of thing. It's also kind of the opposite of where we are with armor, isn't it? It's it's fully yeah. mobile. It's incredibly reliable. It's got a pretty good track record that it's been discussed in the sidebar. I mean, they were using in various armies for decades after the war. Um, that's and that's, about, that's the, the small end of our arsenal. As we get later on and we get to 3.5, 3.7s and 5.5s and things, I mean, they, they dwarf the 25 pounder, a universally well accepted um, artillery piece. And 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 that's yeah. that's Montgomery's doing along with his artillery advisors, which is where we started. Yeah, exactly. And, and can also pinch hit uh, as an AT gun at need as well, which is, yeah. you know, a very useful attribute. So, yeah, the, the, the bottom line is you have to look at Kirkman's uh, overall plan for this battle and just say it was it was masterful. Um, he he smashes uh, the German his German opposite numbers. I mean that's that's item number one on the fire plan for night one is to you know do a preliminary counter battery shoot and get his get rid of as many German field pieces and take them off the field right now. That's the first 15 minutes of this uh, this opening bombardment uh, before he's going to switch over to the sort of the rolling advances that are going to screen the infantry. But you look at um, the number of artillery systems that are destroyed by that bombardment, it's quite high. 
And actually, uh, a lot of the German AT pieces are also going to be taken out uh, by artillery, by indirect fire. That's all very, very important. Now, there's a staggering amount of photos on the Australia, Australian War Memorial website of knocked out uh, German vehicles and artillery pieces where there's not an allied vehicle in sight. So they're clearly knocked out by artillery. They're clearly knocked yeah. out at, at, at mid to long range. And there's just like staggering numbers of photos taken even as late as like a year later, people are still finding other little convoys and groups and batteries still that have been pounded. Um, I want to bring your attention back to combined arms again. And yeah. because an, as an aspect of combined arms that's essential is, is good communications. And it's fair to say mm -hmm. in 1940 in the Battle of France, communications between the various allied British, French, but was, was non-existent to awful. Uh, but by 42, it's getting better. And a specific question from Trent Talenka, who is our kind of radar communications guy. And it's about the Americans there. Do you know how reliant the UK army at this point of the war was on wire versus radio communications? Wow. No, I'm, I am not up to speed on that. I will say that from, um, from an air power perspective, one of the things that you end up seeing throughout this year is the equipage of more and more um, British Army units with the ability to communicate with aircraft. So there's a lot more radios that are being put throughout the Army uh, in really with liaison officers so that you can call in tactical air. That is certainly increasing markedly throughout this year. And so you you see that there's much more flexibility in being able to get those TAC air assets onto a target uh, much more quickly. But I, I am not expert enough in communications in the British Army to answer that question intelligently. No, I don't know either. But I mean, I want to address the, the communications generally and also the, the, the inter- national skills that are going on and Cedric made that point on Monday as well is that apart from the 14th army in Bur out in Burma which is even more multinational and you could argue the right yeah good point mm -hmm. there's a hell of a lot of different you mentioned it yourself there's Aussies and New Zealanders and South Africans and Brits and Poles and French and Americans and Canadian you know it's it's a massive force and it, it seems that the Eighth Army was running fairly harmoniously at this point. And we yeah. have a couple of questions I want to get back to about how much of that Montgomery brought to the Eighth Army himself and how much had been set in. People said, why we haven't mentioned Alexander yet either. The orc came up in conversation because yeah. Montgomery kind of liked to say that when he arrived, he changed everything and every everything he did was everything that he brought about was his own idea and it's not really the case as we said he he yeah football or sporting energy, he, he kind of galvanized ideas so how much of the success at Alamein really was some of the earlier commanders groundwork right well yeah that's a good point and to me it does not smell correct to say that that he was responsible certainly for for welding together this multinational force that was already in place you know well beforehand um, so that, that does not feel right. And, and you're also quite right in pointing out that, uh, he capitalized certainly on some of the staff work that had already been done by the AUK and, you know, some of his staff officers, they had put together an appreciation for where they thought the best place to, uh, put a counterattack in against the German lines was, and it's in the Northern part of the line. If, if you're going to, you know, attack their uh, anywhere on that line, that's where you should go. Likewise, uh, Battle of Alam Halfa, uh, that staff study had already been done mm -hmm. and was was basically sitting on the desk when Montgomery walked in. And of course, he appropriated it shamelessly and said, it's mine um, and, and went forth to victory. I mean, you know, the winners do write the history books, right? Yeah. I, I'm interested in your opinion. Okay, so... We we when I look at the at thirty core, uh, I think they're all quality divisions, and but but really the two premier ones are Ninth Australian and Second New Zealand. My my feeling is that uh, I love the New Zealanders. They're you know elite troops, absolutely, and and have a real affinity for mobile operations, as we're going to see later on after this battle is fought. You know they're going to be one of the the chief pursuit forces but for just sheer bloody minded offensiveness and the ability to ram an attack 
down somebody's throat. You, you just got to love the Australians. Where, where do you come down on that? Um, I, I, I agree. I, I'm quite a fan of the fourth Indian division. I think, I think Interesting. They, okay. they, they, they were well led, did a lot of good stuff. Uh, yeah. General Booker, uh, Al, Al Murray talks about Francis Tuca in his command book and singles him out as being a really good commander. So I think, I know they're not massively essential to El Alamein, but they're, they're kind of there. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think you, you have to single out the Aussies and New Zealanders as, as being very, very good at their job. And I think the Australians particularly maybe have that slight, the Canadian Normandy Dieppe kind of revenge thing to Brook. They've got mm. a bit of motivation. Um, the South African units as well, I think. Uh, we're we're talking solid. about them next week as well. I mean, th this, is, this is going back the idea about when I was reading the comics as a kid, it was all Brits. It was all Scousers and Mancunians and London Cockneys. I don't, there are occasionally where Australians turned up, but I don't think as a kid, I was really aware of the fully international aspect of, of LA. Right. It was the Scots with the bagpipes in the minefield and then right. kind of tank crews of, of, of Cockneys with no teeth. That's kind of how I remember it. Yeah. Calling everybody governor. Um, well, and so again, this has analogs in the Pacific as well. You know, we as Americans, we tend to overfocus on the Marine Corps. You know, that and, and don't get me wrong, you know, the Marines punched well above their weight in terms of the, the size of the fighting force that, that they were. Uh, but the U.S. Army is by far the largest ground force in the Pacific, uh, certainly by the end of the war. And it also overlooks the contributions of the Australians there, too. Yeah. You know, the, the bulk of MacArthur's troops in the early part of the war are Australian. And they're splendid. I mean, they are arguably, other than 1st Marine Division, I think they're the finest infantry in the Pacific. They are ferocious on the attack. They are aggressive patrollers, um, really good field craft, and incredibly high esprit de corps. You know, their unit cohesion is just yeah, yeah. phenomenal. So, I, I, yeah, back to Alamein, you know, just sort of looking at the multi- national character of this army it, it really is an interesting outfit i mean it's back to the back to the 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 iconic images it's Mo, Mo, al alamein is monty versus rommel brits versus germans italians rarely get a mention so on the enemy side they, they don't get a mention you know people Which ask is... Is, is is el alamein a big event in in egypt and i would argue it is it's also very big yeah. in israel because it's considered the the salvation of palestine you know that, fair that, so, so lots of nations, lots of viewpoints of El Alamein that are kind of looking at it from a different, a different angle. It's that you know, if if, and that's why again we bring we're bringing you on because of this this yeah. American perspective on what I think has become a uniquely British, uh, right, full right, rolling yeah. a battle. Yeah, I, I we should talk about the Italians. You know, the Italians, yeah. this is one of the things in my book that I really do try to address is that they get totally overshadowed. Yeah. Um, Rommel would never have been in Egypt without the Italians, you know, without Italian infantry here, uh, he, he would not have been able to hold this line. There's no way in hell. Uh, two, you know, the very last armored outfit on the Axis side that fights in this battle credibly is... is um, area division when he yeah. brings them up from the south and they just get absolutely mauled of course at, at uh you know in the, the final days of the battle by by the british tank brigades but there's a tendency on the part of the americans which i think is driven by british historiography to sort of poo poo the italians and oh they were terrible and we need to take into consideration the level of equipment that they had and the amount of training that they were able to be given. I feel that under the right circumstances and given uh, a mission uh, that they were, you know, properly configured for, they could, they could perform very, very well. They were very credible. And so uh, it, it's sort of a shame that a lot of their contributions get overshadowed uh, as a result and quite innovative, innovative as well. And you know, the truck mounted kind of tank destroyer unit. Yeah. Is, 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 it, you know, it and wasn't then, perfect, but it was, an, it was a solution that, that worked. And, you know, right. we're, we're, 
and and yeah. the 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 Semavente uh, seventy five was a very credible self propelled gun. It could you know it could certainly perforate uh, an Allied tank, at least most of them. So uh, it, it's kind of what I want to say. It's it's a little sad to look at some of the preceding battles um, where Auk is very clearly intentionally taking advantage of Italian weaknesses in anti tank guns and also at night fighting and you know launching these set piece attacks uh like australian ninth division goes after sabratha uh division at, at the first battle and just destroys it mm -hmm. to the point that that division is never even reconstituted it's just wiped off the books new zealand uh does you know the same thing against um a couple of the others uh in that battle as well this is why you've got that corseting going on in the northern part of the sector where you've got um uh german uh regiments you know corseted along with with italian formations uh in the in the trento and, and bologna divisions there it's because the real weakness of the italians was in their heavy weapons they just didn't have enough of them but if you could put their infantry formations in a position where they're surrounded by german guns on either side then you have the ability to you know, bolster their defenses and actually let them fight to the best of their capabilities. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, so another question for you is, and we talked about this briefly before we went live, is that the the like with the Battle of Britain, where a set of dates were agreed upon as when it started and when it ended, and Dilip Saka and others have said, but there are pilots killed before the officials start of the Battle of Britain who should be counted, and the Germans yeah. didn't count it ending they sort of thought about it as morphing into the bombing campaign when writing about el alamein the question i think is is so important is is when do you start the story how much of an intro do you do in that how much of of the 1940 41 stuff and compass mm. and that do you explain and how many of the commanding change the commander officer changes a tactical change the divisional shuffles around how much of that is relevant when you're talking yeah. about the Battle of El Alamein. And again, we're specifying particularly the second Battle of El Alamein, but yeah. some people say it's the third because they split the first battle into two. So where, yeah. where are you on where you start the story? Well, you know, I have the advantage in that my book is, you know, pretty closely or sharply defined. It's December of 41 to December of 42. It's 13 months, um, which actually, from a narrative standpoint, works surprisingly well for the majority of the war. Um, it does not in the desert, in that you come into the in the middle of um, of Crusader, it's sort of sort of a hot mess. I have a a preceding chapter called Shape of War, which basically talks right. about the economies and the militaries of each of the major um, combatants in the war. I can't go into too too much detail, but you know I have to at least set the stage so that people can understand where we are uh, in each of these narrative threads: Eastern Front, North Africa, and so forth. So I have the advantage in that you know my preceding months will have already talked about Gazala and you know First Alamein and Alam Halfa and, and that sort of thing. Um, for me, it's fairly clean then to say you know. Second Battle of Alamein goes from 23 October to, you know, roughly 4 November, something like that. And that that's good enough. I, to your, your larger point about turning points, you know, is this mm -hmm. a turning point in the war? Um, I hate that phrase. It's, yeah, and, it's, 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 a low, it's too loaded, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it really is. Um, and in particular, I don't think it, uh, accommodates the nature of this particular war. The the classic definition of a turning point or a decisive battle, I should say, because that's another phrase that gets used on a decisive battle. What does that really mean? In the old days, a decisive battle was we've got these two sides that are relatively evenly matched, and whoever wins this decisive battle is going to go on to win the war. That model doesn't apply in World War II. This is this is a war being fought by enormously powerful alliance blocks that have the ability to absorb both victories and defeats and not necessarily be forced off the field. So, again, I know this is heresy for a guy who wrote a book on the Battle of Midway, which is commonly, you know, talked about as being a decisive battle or a turning point. 
I think you can make a pretty, a pretty compelling argument that win or lose at Midway, the Americans are still going to win the war against the Japanese, at least. So Midway yeah. is not, not really a, a, a decisive turning point uh, in that sense. So if we look at Alamein, I think it's a very important inflection point. But as I look at 1942 as a whole, I would say that there are probably two dozen or so important questions that need to be answered, not only on the battlefield, but also in terms of the economies and systems of mobilization and that sort of thing. And that that what we see in 1942 happening is this gradual turning of this enormous man of war. So the momentum of this conflict is now shifting over towards the Allies' favor. But it's not any one battle that ends up doing that. That said, you could write a tremendous book just about the one-month period from 23 October to 23 November of 1942. And that encompasses... Uh, what I think are, are, are the four most important inflection points for the Allies on the battlefield. Alamein, Lean Torch. Gently. <laughs> yeah. Right. Alamein, Torch, uh, Stalingrad, and Guadalcanal. Yeah. Those are the biggies. And, and by the time you, you ring down to 23 November, which is when the pincers close at Kalak in Russia you know, and seals uh, the fate of, of German 6th Army and a, a pretty appreciable portion of 4th Panzer Army as well. You know, the Allies have now fundamentally changed the complexion of this war. They are firmly ashore in North Africa, which means that, you know, win or lose at Alamein, Rommel is getting his, his back door kicked in. Um, and the, the German position in North Africa is, I would argue, pretty much doomed. Um, even though we're going to be held up in Tunisia for a, a, a quite a long while. Meanwhile, in the Pacific, um, with victory at, at the second naval battle of Guadalcanal, the, uh, the Japanese Navy is, is kind of getting the clue that they, they just can't hold on here. We've lost two battleships in the course of three days. We just we can't take that pounding. So those four battles, I feel like kind of, now have have firmly made it made it clear to everybody that this war is now on a on a different trajectory and it's going to be very difficult for the for the axis to to push yeah. it back trentalenko made the point oh that interesting if he hadn't i would have done is that the the, the the pedestal convoy to malta in august is, is part of the the seed sowing that that enables the, the alamein victory later on and i you know and if alan allport was joining us right now he would yeah say, no that's that's an interesting comment also, Sorry to interrupt. That is, the, is the year of the majority of the American soldiers who fought through Tunisia, Italy, Normandy were trained in 42, 43. The majority of the British Army who fought through uh, ETO were being trained in 42. The manuals are being rewritten. The m- use of machine guns, use of this, use of infantry. 42 is when a lot of the stuff is actually being happening off stage. It's happening yeah. in the background. For, and you would argue as a naval historian, that, that I'm sure that's happening with, with, with carrier tactics, with aviation tactics, the marine squadrons, all the, the things that were employed later on in Peleliu and things like that. 42 is the year all that's being developed behind the scenes, isn't it? Yeah, no, I think I think that's a very good point. Um, you know, certainly the U.S. Navy's maturation is not complete at this point. We are certainly in terms of surface combat are still very much struggling. Uh, to adapt to Japanese techniques. And, you know, Trent Hone has, has written uh, extensively on that topic. Um, so, yeah, th- there are still transformations that need to happen, but a lot of the fundamental work, as you say, has now been done. You know, switch over to the Eastern Front. The, the transformation that the Red Army goes through during this 15-month time period is astonishing. and often misunderstood and, and downplayed. And, and particularly in, in light of what we're seeing happening in Ukraine today, where we've got a, a very wooden, unresponsive, unadaptable Russian army, to contrast that with what happened in the Red Army during this time period is, is just a complete night and day. The Red Army rips apart its organizational structure not once but twice, completely top to bottom. 
Uh, they tear their org chart down into individual brigades in many cases. But in the middle of 42, you see that start getting rebuilt into first tank and mechanized corps. And eventually we're going to you know, reconstitute the tank army as well. Um, they're completely moving around artillery within their org chart. They're pulling a lot of the heavier tubes out and up into regiments that are being held at uh, in the reserve level by the Stavka and using uh, being assigned specifically to certain battlefields under direct control of Voronov and some of his subordinates that are real arti artillery specialists. There's a tremendous increase in the number of automatic weapons in your average rifle uh, division. They're becoming a lot less about rifles and a lot more about submachine guns and other automatic weapons and also organic AT weapons. So there's this, you know, this real uh, rip it up and put it all back together in the face of doing this fighting retreat against the most competent army in the world. I mean, it's, it's a staggering achievement. Meanwhile, the Americans on the ground, I think the one thing that really becomes clear at Guadalcanal you know, if if you if you look at the Americans coming into that battle, the only people that have any experience in fighting the Japanese on the ground, all of that corporate knowledge is gone because they were all captured in the Philippines, right? They're all in Japanese concentration camps at this point. So the Americans have got some real question marks going into Guadalcanal. You know, can we really go toe to toe with these guys uh, who play this very smash mouth, up tempo mode of warfare that we've seen in places like Malaya? But what gets vindicated at uh, Guadalcanal is the fundamental soundness of the infantry artillery team in the U.S. That the U.S. arguably has the best artillery in the world. They certainly have the most shells. Um, and the flexibility of our fire control and the ability to bring that fire where it's needed, when it's needed, is just second, second to no one. So... The Americans, too, are now having to adapt to a new environment in terms of jungle combat, but they do have something going for them in that they know that an infantry artillery team is working. And now, you know, on the British side, what they realize at the end of this battle is that, okay, you know, the light bulb is still not on in terms of armor infantry cooperation, but God, you know, the artillery is really, really good. And in that, in combination with uh, air supremacy, you know, that, that, uh, that compensates for a lot of ills, I guess I would say. Yeah, and you make an interesting point about the, the Red Army, because one of the things I think that is also important about the Red Army in 42, 43 compared to today is they were masters of their own public image and their propaganda. The, the Russian posters from World War II are insanely good, and they are completely Fair, failing. Yeah. In, in to globally, I understand that if you're living in Moscow, you're being presented a different version, but globally, they're not winning the war at all, uh, in, in, right. in the publicity terms. But in 42, they, they probably absolutely were. And I think this is you know, you, you said something there about the you know, the British combined arms or the Commonwealth combined arms has yet, not yet perfected itself, but the belief in it. Do, is it mm. important for the belief to come first before the ability? Because I think I mean, this is back to the media representations, because you've got to think about all those war illustrated magazines and periodicals that made the, the, the British bookshelves and newspaper stands in the in the in the, in the leading up to I guess they by the time they make the, the stands, it's leading up to Christmas 42, I suppose. People are looking for good news. Yeah. And we know now those Pathé images of the British moving up past the knocked out tank were staged. They weren't actually during the battle, they were sometime later but the importance of those images in the theaters are not just in the uk but in the us they would have made their way there they'd have made their way to moscow they'd have made their way i guess around the world so yeah the belief in combined arms definitely came out of el alamein even if it hadn't right. actually matched itself on the battlefield is that would, would you agree with that yeah, I, I would I would certainly say that the importance in terms of morale was absolutely critical. And, and this this gets to a, a point, I think it was Corelli Barnett made in his in his book. He questioned why you had to fight Alamein at all. Yeah. Alan you know, Allport made that same question this week on Twitter. The second right. battle, was it really necessary? And the argument the people who responded said, not maybe militarily, but definitely for the for the morale of everybody. Bingo. And I, I absolutely agree with that, that yes, it's one thing, you know, if you kick in the back door at Torch and that is a successful operation, 
you can argue that that seals Rommel's yeah. fate. Yeah. But it it was absolutely vital again for the for the British to be able to say we created this victory. It was our victory. I, and I, I, yeah, and I think. If we had just, rel- I love the way this conversation is going all sprawling. I hope you're enjoying it as well, folks. But the viewing view numbers are good. But I think if the Allies had just relied on torch, it might have been seen as almost cheating by playing a different type of warfare in that we needed to best the Germans and the Italians in the desert where they had bested us. It had to, it's like, if you've been defeated at Wembley in the FA Cup final in 1981, you have to go back in 82 and do it on the same stadium, on the same pitch, with the same fans then. I feel that's the second battle of al Alamein has to have that quality. Montgomery needs to come out of it. The, all those British troops, the 9th Australian Division, had been through to Brooke and all that, all the, the 7th Armoured Division, all those people there had to have feel, felt at the end of it that they had bested Rommel in his backyard effectively where he had been the master and now we are the masters i think i think that's absolutely right on the money i i agree with that 100 percent. that and again from a political standpoint too churchill has got to have that as well absolutely yeah he, he, just for his career let alone his right. own yeah yeah he's um, got to so have actually- that so yeah it would not have done to have not fought this battle and then have this question mark still be sitting out here you know, did we really, did we beat Rommel fair and fair or did yeah. we just kick in his back door and oblige him to withdraw? Um, yeah, it was, it was very important to have demonstrated moral ascendancy on the battlefield yep. uh, and, and to demolish the poster boy of, yep. of the German army, you know, who had, who had been, you know, their bane for the last, you know, 15 months or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the, and a the, lo- the moral know, aspect is huge. I, and a long fifteen months. I know, folks, months are standard length, but I think, well, I, well, I I feel that the year during lockdown was a much longer year than a normal year because, as Einstein said, the perception of time is different. I think if you're a British civilian or an Aussie or New Zealand or anybody else, that period from the fall of France and then, right, as you said, those terrible era when Singapore falls and yeah. we kicked in out of Malaya and we're losing the Battle of the Atlantic. Those couple of years, well, we, we, from we're going May 1940 to, to uh, October 42, we're just nearly two and a half years were a long fucking two and a half yeah, years. Yeah, no, that's that's absolutely right. I'm I'm a big fan of of Alan Brooks' diary. You know, I keep it down on my floor here just because it's such interesting reading. And and you know, there's there's this one passage uh, that he's writing about just after the channel dash where he, he puts in, these are black days. And that, that to me just summarizes, uh, yeah, the first seven or eight months of this year, mm-hmm. that it's just, it's just a, it's a slog the entire time. And as Richard Overy put it, um, there's no indication that, uh, you know, the average man on the street would have guessed that the war is going to end this way. No, no. So, so we've kind of covered the a bit, uh, covered a bit of the perception, the mythology, the the importance for it on a moral and morale basis. But again, go bringing it back. We've got the, the the battle map up there. Any other things in your study of this, in your understanding of it, in the way your analytical approach to battles that you you kind of you you still question Montgomery's first draft of the battle. Any other things that you still a, a pondering or thinking, well, that was weird, or how did they get away with that, or the outcome of that bit there still surprised me. Anything about it that kind of you're, no, I, you're struggling over? I, I feel like I've actually covered the the majority of things that that kind of strike me uh, uh, about the battle. I should say too that it looks like my video may have frozen. I'm not sure about that. I can hear you just fine, no, but it's I'm, fine. Everything, everything, well, everything's fine for uh, my okay. end. No, that 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 is the, the majority of my takeaways on it. Honestly, that that this is a battle that is, in some ways, uh, the British are compensating for some of their weaknesses, but they're able to uh, uh, come away with a with a win because they're supporting uh, arms in terms of artillery and air power. Really, uh, do exonerate some of their their other uh, ills on the battlefield. Okay, so. Um... Well, thanks for that. I mean, you, you, we gave a bit of an assessment of Montgomery at the b- beginning, basically summarizing as a bit of a dickhead, but he's quite good at what he does. Well, you haven't really talked about Rommel much. So, I mean, again, yeah. 
every every show this in these two weeks, Montgomery and Rommel are going to have to come up in the conversation because that is the that they are the figureheads. What do you ask? What do you assess me? If you want to continue talking about Montgomery, fine, but I also want Rommel. What what's Rommel's? Yeah, let me say one last thing about Montgomery, um, and then yeah, let's talk about Rommel. You know, a lot of uh, it, from battle plan design standpoint, you you look at this, and and I say in my manuscript that the overall British battle plan is about as exciting as paving a sidewalk. Okay, it's just. Chung, chung, chung. You know, it's a bludgeon fest. We're just going to, we're going to beat the enemy down through weight of numbers in a, in a lot of cases. And particularly the aftermath of the battle where we do not succeed in rounding up Rommel, right? He gets away. But you, you made the point earlier that uh, it, it couldn't be fought along German lines, that, that every time uh, the British have answered the siren call to come dance out in the desert with, with Rommel, you know, the result is disaster. And at this point in the war, and this is a point that Robert Satino made in his book, you know, the British couldn't afford to lose another army. Yeah. You know, we're already getting pretty down towards the bottom of the barrel in terms of British manpower at this point. And, the Secretary of Labor has just made it clear to uh, Churchill that, you know, if we take any more people out of the factories uh, to put them into uniform, we're really going to start hurting our production here. So unlike uh, the Americans or the Russians, uh, you know, the British have got to be very careful with their manpower. And so whereas armchair strategists may look at, at this battle plan and say, well, it certainly lacks a, a great deal of flair and Montgomery was overly cautious. Yeah, guilty is charged, but he also understood that he couldn't afford to lose this army. And so if the enemy gets away, you know, okay, that's a bummer, but it, it's not worth the risk of, you know, getting surprised out there somewhere, you know, towards the Libyan border and, and getting encircled and smashed. It's just, it ain't worth it. Rommel. Um, Another great PR guy, obviously, someone who played uh, the PR card for all it was worth. Especially Under after his death. I mean, <laughs> his yeah. ghost probably did more right. to, to, to reinforce his image with the public. If I, I don't believe yeah. anything, in the 1950s, he must have been looking down and going, well, that's amazing how, I, how I'm being portrayed by even yeah. Hollywood, you know. I managed to, to pull that off. And, you know, some of that is... is um, consonant with with this whole sort of rehabilitative uh full court press that people like monstein and melanton and those guys you know that, oh we fought the good clean war and those evil you know ss we didn't know what was going on there but you, that's all baloney obviously um and rommel benefits from that you know and you're right he benefits in that he's dead uh so he he and the fact that he was forced to commit suicide uh you know, makes him look all the more noble, which he wasn't. I mean, you're absolutely right that this battle saves Palestine. And, you know, would Rommel have cheerfully gone into Palestine and murdered all the Jews there? Absolutely. You know, he was not some sort of noble warrior. Um, I think he's a tremendous leader. I think he did have a real flair for mobile operations. Obviously, he was ex he was typical but even more than typical in terms of the aggression level that you see within the german officer corps um you know they, they've got a stable full of of aggressive uh panzer commanders and he's just sort of emblematic of that uh, he's very much a lead from the from the forward end of the battle kind of guy which creates all sorts of problems i mean you talk about combined arms we always extol the virtues of you know, the Luftwaffe was always able to operate uh, in concert with, with German ground forces. And yet, uh, this is a guy who is often leading from the fore and is so far out of contact that, you know, uh, the commander of, of, of Flieger, Fliegerfuhrer Africa doesn't know where, know where Rommel is. And so how do I coordinate with this dude, um, you know, if, if he's continually out of touch? Not only that, but he had a real nasty habit of stealing the Luftwaffe's trucks. Well, it's pretty tough to move your air support up along with the remainder of your army if you haven't got trucks to do it. There's an instance where 
uh, the Luftwaffe has to go hat in hand to the Italians and borrow 500 of their trucks in order to, you know, move some of the forward elements uh, forward in this battle. And this is one of the reasons that when we look at the sortie count over this battlefield, uh, Western Desert Air Force is, is putting up about 1,000 sorties a day. The Germans are only putting up about 250. And in terms of the effectiveness of those sorties, it's much lower because the British, in many cases, are coming directly at the Luftwaffe and are you know, aiming for air superiority over the battlefield. So they're interdicting a lot of these German sorties before they can even come into the battlefield space, forcing these guys to jettison their bombs and get into dogfights and what have you. Uh, so from the average German infantryman standpoint, the Luftwaffe doesn't even exist. The only planes I see up in the sky are British. Hmm. So, yeah, you know, Rommel's kind of a mixed bag. I think he's a, he's a tremendous leader, but he did not have a good appreciation for the merits of sound staff work. He didn't really give a rat's ass about logistics either. Well, which, I was just going to ask logistics because, yeah, you know, you're, you're a Pacific theater dude. And if, yeah. you ha if you're going to conquer anything in the Pacific, you have to master logistics because... Yep fuel you know the, the getting drinkable water to those in the iron hopping campaign all that yeah stick that is often used to beat rummel with in the last decade or two is his failure to grasp logistics which is something that montgomery definitely has a better grasp on is that would you agree with that i, I would agree with that and, it, and it's interesting because you know the desert in some ways is fairly analogous to what you see happening out in the pacific in that Everything that you need to wage a modern war must be brought in from outside. As you say, there's, you know, you got to get water up, you got to get petroleum, you got to get ammo. I mean, there's, there is nothing out here. And it's the same thing at a place like Guadalcanal. Everything has got to be brought in. Back to the earlier point from one of our viewers about the importance of Malta to this whole thing. Hmm. Um, and it's not only Malta, but it was also sort of the shift in uh, the, naval balance in the eastern mediterranean when the italians managed to knock out um two of the british battleships uh and you know put them on the you know valiant and queen elizabeth and put them on the, the bottom of uh of alexandria's harbor no they weren't actually sunk sunk but they were out of commission right yeah, yeah, yeah. and they don't have a carrier there anymore which meant that the Italian Navy really for the majority of 1942 is very successful in bringing supplies across the Mediterranean. But that starts to fall apart uh, towards the end of the year because, as our viewer said, pedestal meant that by hook or by crook, you know, when we drag the shattered carcass of the SS Ohio into that harbor and offloaded its cargo as it gently burbled into the you know the mud of of uh, the grand harbor you know that that gives them enough aviation fuel to be in business now for months and and enough food as well and all of a sudden you start seeing the the attrition rate on those italian convoys start to go back up again well that's the thing that i think gets forgotten about pedestal it's going to come up on monday's show with richard hammond is that it's then the the increasing of the anti-shipping policy and uh, the, yeah. the, the 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 saving of Malta was again kind of switching from the defensive uh footing to a to an offensive footing because as you say the fuel yes. enables the the, the the maritime war to start becoming more of an attack minded one and that and you again you yep. see that change you see that that switch in the in the Italians ability to get stuff there and and yep. this is bringing it back to the second battle of Ma Alamein is that, yeah, that basic pendulum nature of the North African campaign is that when the British are, are, are being forced back, they are able to supply themselves better and the Germans are having the problems of the And then when the Germans are being pushed back, the reverse happens. And I think Absolutely. this is when we get towards the end, this is you know, that November and even December period, and we're going, we're going to show on Friday talking about the December confrontations, is that if Rommel had now been Montgomery on the advance and Montgomery had now been Rommel on the defence, Montgomery might have been able to master the logistical retreat better yeah. than Rommel did because yeah. Rommel, Rommel now falls apart quite rapidly. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, that, 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 that is showing, it's showing up his um his his failure to master the logistics. I think that that no that that late November December period. Yeah, no, and and you're absolutely right too that you know one of the advantages that the the Western Desert Air Force has at this point is that they're operating out of this core complex of airfields in Egypt. These are concrete strip of uh, airfields. Uh, there's a guy named Dawson who is sort of the logistical right hand man uh, for uh, Tedder and Cunningham, and he's he's a genius when it comes to taking Egyptian workshops with Egyptian workers and do things like repairing propellers and whatnot. So, again, from yeah, from a logistical standpoint, you know, they've got this core that they're operating from that is only a you know 100 so miles away from this battlefield and it really it really shows on that battlefield as well but that, we yeah, do, sorry I, I was going to say too with with respect to malta the other thing that's going on in malta is they have a new air commander there who uh was extremely aggressive in i don't want to just survive these attacks that are coming down from sicily on top of me i i actually want to go and you know beat those attacks back north of Malta and actually start taking the fight to Sicily as well. This in turn points to the fact that there are very limited uh, German air assets within the Mediterranean, and they were trying to do too many things at once. Um, you can't bomb Malta into ruins and still have the necessary air power down in North Africa to support Rommel. It's got to be one or the other. and so. Yes, the German air campaign against Malta was very successful in the April to May time frame. But at that point, they then start pulling those assets out uh, to get ready to support Gazala, um, which is going to happen at the end of May. And from that point on, yeah, uh, Malta was hurting, but it was not nearly as in bad a shape as it had been in April and May. Hmm. No, definitely. So. To, to kind of start winding things up, I mean, one of the things that yeah. I like about what we're doing on YouTube is that unlike a book, unlike a PhD thesis that, that has, it, it can't evolve as it's happening. These conversations can evolve as they're happening. Things happen in the sidebar. And as we get further into the two weeks and, and the, the, the various historians have come on and, and given their views, my understanding will have evolved. I, I think I'll be a different at a different place understanding this at the end of the two weeks, as will the viewers. Um, because of the variety of historians we've got male, female, South African, British, New Zealand, American, blah, blah, blah. Is yeah. that, what questions are there to maybe still ask about El Alamein stroke, the North African campaign that still need still need asking? That's a really good question. Um I don't know that I've got a credible answer to be, you know, again, you guys have written 500 books about this. Yeah, damn uh, it's probably, it's probably two more since we finished started yeah. the show. There's probably two more on the shelves right now. Yeah. Right. You know, although to that point, I will say that um, I, you're going to have uh, uh, Colvin on your, yeah. on your channel yeah. here. Right. I, that book to me was uh, a, just a really welcome addition to that enormous bookshelf in that, again, I'm a doctrine kind of guy, and I was really interested in the, the sort of training that went into Eighth Army and, and also just the kind of the cultural yeah, underlines within the, the British Army as well that, you know, the, the tankers are a completely different social caste, yeah. if you will, than the infantry commanders and that that they come from from different sensibilities in terms of british social caste that i just thought that dimension was fascinating well this is the kind of work that people like alan allport and jonathan fennell uh, are doing in that they're looking at the the morale reports across the british mm. army from 40 to 45 and, and and understand how people are thinking at grassroots level and i think that's yeah. one of the one of the fa not failings but one of the limitations of for example, over the decades pre-internet, is British authors writing about the South Africans, for example, would have a vision of the South African forces through a British lens, whereas I've got yeah. a South African historian coming on who's been trained by the South African military history world, who will hopefully, well, not hopefully, he will be bringing that South African perspective, as will Craig Timmons right. tomorrow at the Australian War Memorial, will be giving the Australian vision of an Australian Ninth Division, as opposed to a British 
author's vision of the Australian Ninth Division because our national perspectives are so important that the that the discussion you have with Drac about Midway, both very knowledgeable individuals, but you and, and uh, you you have the American perspective, Drac has the British perspective, and there's a there's a meeting, but there's also a slight. Um, uh, uh, grating of it because of the, uh, this this whole idea about the way everything has been seeped into our brains in our childhoods and, and yeah. you know, the midway film like that like the Battle of Brit Battle of Britain film they're so and pattern are so part of it so yeah El Alamein I think still there were questions about the the I think about the nationality the nationalities involved about the, the mm -hmm. way I mean Cedric's French perspective on Monday was really interesting about how the French brigades perceived the plan and how Montgomery explained it to them, which wasn't necessarily how explained it to anybody else. Oh, interesting. I didn't, I, I don't um, know about that angle, but that, that would be fascinating. Yeah. But so, so that, that I think is where we're going to be going with this is, is that we, 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 we you know, we, we need to get more international voices there, but um, we will bring things to them because we've got, we've got more, more, more things to discuss during the two weeks and you've got things to go and do. But any final points about El Alamein you want to make as an American that you think the viewers should understand or know or be aware of? I, I guess I would, I would just talk about um, or, or reinforce the, the point that you made earlier that I, I think you tend to see a lot of books out there that will take a particular angle on one facet of the battle and try to bump that up the priority list as, oh, this is what decided that battle. I think we as uh, consumers of history uh, need to be comfortable with complexity, that, that with a battle this complex, and, and the same thing is true of, of Midway or, or Stalingrad or any other battle, that there, I'm, I'm extremely skeptical that there is ever one thing that explains victory or defeat in a campaign or a battle of this nature, that it's always... Uh, an accumulation of a number of different factors that have to be weighed. Uh, and again, you know, that we, we need nuanced appraisals of these sorts of things. No, definitely. I mean, it's, to make a comparison with Market Garden, for example, Market Garden is really just those nine days. The experiences of the first Airborne Division ahead of it don't really have any bearing on what happened at Market Garden. So so you can cover that in a single volume and do it yeah, just kind of, I think kind of Alan May, I mean, as you said, James Colvin's book is excellent, but the first half is literally about training. It doesn't get anywhere near almost the Western Desert for the first Right. 40 or 50 page it's about eton and the public school system and and, yeah. and cricket and then it gets to el alame but you, you as you're reading it you understand where he is going with it and you realize that by the time you get to the battle you understand that's how the british army works that's why it's right. been working this way for a long time and i think el alamein a bit like um the Normandy campaign or, or the island hopping campaign, you need a shelf of books to get anywhere right. near to understanding it. There is no such thing as a single volume on the El Alamein that would ever really give it enough nuance. It, yeah, that, that may be true. Although, you know, I, I did like, uh, I did like Neil Barr's Neil book. Barr's book. Yeah. I, I, I thought that in the end, I, I, I did reach out to him but anyway, whatever we, we, we've got yeah. that gift, but another, another time, but John, yeah. it's been absolutely amazing talking to you and I can't Thank wait you so to have you back on when you've, when you've got that book finished and yeah, your perspectives and your analysis has been very welcome and people have loved it. It's been a really good show. So um, when can we expect this, this manuscript you've been working on for 13 years to actually be out in print to read? Um, I'm hoping to have the project wrapped up in another couple of years. I think that's achievable. I still need to crank out the strategic bombing portion of it. Um, fortunately, that's kind of a, a sparse tale to tell in the in the grand scheme of things of 1942, and that you know U.S. Eighth Air Force doesn't really get set up until the end part of the year, and and the British are making this transition from two engine to four engine bombers and, you know, changing their doctrine, yada, yada, yada. There's a fair amount left to do, but the, the book is substantially getting there, I guess I would say. So yeah, a couple of years, something like that. Well, I, I think I'll be around by then. So I'm just going to take Good. off screen for a second while I tell people what's coming up and I'll bring you back for a final goodbye in a few seconds. So Thanks. folks, 
We've got two double bills coming up your way on Thursday and Friday. So tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. UK time, uh, Craig is coming on from Australia to give us the, the understanding of the ninth infantry division. Then in the evening, uh, Mike Bechtold, another in, uh, legend, another previous guest, is coming on to talk about the tactical air power, uh, air power aspect that John talked about earlier. And then Friday, uh, we've got two shows again. We've got the New Zealand perspective in the morning with Glenn Harper. And then we've got a perspective from another American, Zito, is coming on to talk about the battle in December 42. So the Mon Rommel and Monty's next sort of meeting in the desert. And so that's four shows coming at your way. So as always, if you're new to World War II TV, don't forget to share what we're doing with your, your colleagues and friends. Don't forget to like the shows. Leaving us a comment afterwards helps with analytic and the algorithm and go out there and buy those books of the people we have on. And if you haven't read Shattered Sword yet about the Battle of Midway, what the hell are you waiting for? It was one of those five books I did in a, a book review show about a year ago that I said were game changers. So Shattered Sword is a must read. But I'm going to bring John back in to say thanks very much. So uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon, John. It's been absolutely amazing talking to you. I'll have to think of a reason to have you on again soon because I've loved it. I would I would love to come back. So thanks very much for having me. It was great. Brilliant. Okay, then, everybody, I will see you all again tomorrow. This is Paul Villach, World War II TV, saying enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers, everybody. <laughs>